بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الذي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين we alhamdulillah have tawfiq to continue our study of moral concepts alhamdulillah in the previous session we talked about those concepts which are obligational because we said there are seven major moral concepts which are divided into two groups evaluative and obligational arzashi evaluative Elzami obligation. Oat and oat not and obligation are discussed. As you remember, we made a distinction between three types of necessity. Al wujub that something is you know necessary by itself by its essence something it is necessary by the other or in relation to something else and then we explain that how our mind has come up with the concept of moral obligation or moral out or out not and that is by saying that if you want this end, this ideal, like perfection, this action is needed, or this quality is needed. So this quality leads to that perfection or nearness to God. Allah Metabatabai uses al wujub bil ghair Ayatollah Mesba uses wujub bil qiyas ila al ghair and we said both can be correct. Depending, do you mean perfection as an idea or perfection which has happened? Perfection as an idea is illah, perfection as a reality is ma'lul. Because al illatul ghaiyah comes before as illah, but its reality comes afterwards. You make the chair, why? Because you want to sit. You want to have rest. But the actual sitting and resting comes after the chair is made. So what is Illatul Ghaiya? The actual sitting? No, the actual sitting has not happened. Illatul Ghaiya, which is Sharikul Illatul Fa'iliya, which is motivating the agent, is the imagination or the conception that I am going to benefit for this purpose that purpose is before but materialization of purpose comes later therefore we said you can say <coughs> this action is made necessary because I want perfection or you can say this action produces perfection in any case alhamdulillah we talked about this now we want to move on to the concept of good and bad. What is moral goodness? What is moral badness? Okay? So, among moral philosophers, there are different views, different schools of thought about what is the definition of moral goodness and badness and how we understand moral goodness and badness before pointing to differences here there is a point in Ayatollah Misbah's book which might be useful because there is a similar debate not in moral philosophy but in philosophy in general about beauty in Ilmul Jamal, 
what makes something beautiful or ugly? There's a discussion. Some people say beauty is like color. Is mafhum mahovi is something which exists independently. Some people say beauty is not mafhum mahovi. Beauty is to be taken after reflection. It's entezari. Some people say beauty is only understood by intuition. Some people say beauty is conventional and based on the contract. Something that is good and beautiful in one culture, maybe not beautiful in another culture. So there are different views about what is beauty. Okay? Similar to that, not exactly the same, but similar to that is the discussion about moral goodness or moral badness. Or in Arabic, we say, al husnu wal qubh I have said many times uh, here in other lectures that in Arabic there is a difference between husn and khair. Or between qubh and sharr. Khair means good and sometimes is better. Host means goodness with beauty. There is always beauty in the meaning of host. Hassan means good and beautiful. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُولُوا لَلنَّاسِ حُسْنًا Or يَقُولُوا الَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنًا Means something which is good and beautiful. You should say something which is good and beautiful. Something which is appreciated, which is pleasant, which is nice. Not just good. I can, for example, say something good to you, but at the same time, say it in the way that you feel offended. For example, you know, someone has a bad habit for example in eating something or doing something okay he should stop it but there are different ways to say to him to stop it you can say in the way that he would appreciate you can say in the way that he would get angry and do more say something which is good and beautiful Nice. Okay. Now we want to see when we say something is good or bad in English. Morally good or bad. Or we say it's in Arabic hasanun or qabihun. What does it mean? Okay. Allah metabatabai rahmatullah alayhi has a general idea in many discussions in al mizan he applies this general idea he believes that normally terms are first and primarily coined for physical and material use but then little by little, there is extension made in the meaning. They are stretched to be applied to immaterial things. For example, light initially is coined for physical light. But then we do tosa, we extend the meaning and we can use it even for light of iman. For light of Amal Saleh, for light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A scale, Mizan. Mizan is primarily, initially coined for what? For the instrument by which shopkeepers, for example, weigh things. But we do tosa'a, we extend and expand the meaning to use it for any way of weighing and comparing things. Even it can be not physical things. 
yeah, like mizanul a'mal. Mizanul a'mal is not by gram or kilogram, yeah, but still we use the term which initially was made for the physical use. The same is with husn and qubh. Alamit Abatabai in volume 5 of Al Mizan. He says, it might be said that initially, Hosn was coined in Arabic for physical beauty, a beauty that appears on face of someone, or body of someone. If someone's face and body is pleasant, it's attractive, it's nice, they call it he has or she has husn. Or maybe they use it even for other things. For example, this horse is beautiful. This flower is beautiful, but initially for something physical. Hope also for ugliness, something which you don't like to look at it. Okay? But after this initial meaning, it was expanded. The meaning was expanded, stretched to include, for example, actions which we find pleasant, like justice, ihsan, adl, keeping promises. Yeah? We have now used the term host for such action. We say Adl has husn or Al Adlu Hasanu Al Ihsan Hasanu. It's good and beautiful. Or we say Adul Mukabihun. Qubh initially means ugliness, which is physical ugliness, but now we use it for action. This is the idea of Allame about how our mind comes to understand this goodness or badness. But in addition to this discussion, we have another discussion, which is might maybe more important. Because you may say, okay, whatever is the way our mind comes to this, the main point is what is actually moral goodness or moral badness or moral beauty or moral ugliness? What is it? Like beauty, what is it that makes something beautiful? You know, there are many, many discussions about this. We refer here to five major views among moral philosophers. Five major views among moral philosophers. About what? Ah. What is morally good? What is morally bad? The first view is the view that says Moral goodness and badness are real, are objective, are external, like mahiyat. In the same way that you have Johar and Araz, yeah, you have substance, you have accidents, among accidents, you have colors, all these mahiyya, these mafahim mahuvi, this ma'gulat ula. I hope you remember what we discussed. We have three concepts, yeah? Al ma'gulat al ula, or mafahim mahuvi, or al ma'gulat al thani, al mantiqi, or falsafi. I hope you remember. You know, you cannot forget these things because these are tools that we keep referring to. So some people say moral goodness and moral badness are real things 
are mahiyat, are mafahim mahuvi that exist outside, and we should only understand them. How do you understand them? Not by five senses that you have. Because you cannot hear morality. You know, something is good or bad, you cannot hear that. Or you cannot watch it, or you cannot smell it or taste it. But you can have immediate understanding of this by your aql, through intuition, shahood. If you remember, I explained this when I was referring to discussions. They say, we human beings have a kind of moral sense, a kind of moral understanding. It's not those five, but it is not also through reasoning. We, in the same way that you can understand something is beautiful or not, physically, you can also understand something is morally beautiful or not, morally good or not. One of the most famous people who had this idea is G.E. Moore, George Edward Moore. Moore. He was born in 1873 and died in 1958. Okay? He had this idea that we can understand through our intuition moral goodness or badness. And he is considered as founder of the school of you know, uh, philosophy, moral philosophy, which is based on intuition. According to him, the concept of good is badihi, self-evident, is basic, it cannot be defined, other things can be based on this, but this itself is basic. And it's something that no one can define it. Basit and badihi. Therefore, you cannot define it. He says, if I am asked, he says, if I am asked, for example, if someone, a student, a friend, a colleague, asks me, what is good or which is good? I would say good is good, and this is the maximum that can be said. <laughs> and if I am asked how you define good, my answer is that good cannot be defined. And this is the maximum I can say. So either you understand it through your intuition or you don't understand it. I cannot help you. Every human being. Like, how can you define what is beauty? Physical beauty. Of course, there are people who try to define, but some people say we cannot define it. It's something that we just understand. How do you define, you know, for example, uh, a smells? So, according to these people, the concept of good is the basic concept, is the foundation of all moral concepts. Interestingly, Moore had the idea that good is the main one and the obligation also go back to this. For example, duty, obligation, duty, should be defined according to good, but good cannot be defined. What is duty? Duty is the action that more than any alternative produces good in the world. So you define duty based on good, but you cannot define good further. 
What is my moral duty? To do something which brings the maximum balance of good to the world. Okay? Uh, when did we get this? When did we find this very good mission? This is Which part of our creation. At the time of creation. So we had this lack of change. Are we or? They don't believe in that, but they say human beings, when they have, um, you know, maturity understanding, they have this. Even a child, after two years, three years, or perhaps even earlier, has a moral sense. You have five senses for physical sensation, but you have also moral sense, according to Moore. You have moral sense. Bertrand Russell who was born in 1872 and died in 1970, was also, at least in part of his life, very much influenced by Moore. He says, good and bad, means moral goodness and badness, are properties that belong to the things independent from our ideas and beliefs. Like being a square or circle. Whether something is a square or circle has nothing to do with us. It's real. It's a property of something external. Okay. And you see, there is something positive in Moore's view. What is positive in Moore's view? Ah, that he gives some recognition to morality. He doesn't say morality is just based on false imagination. But the problem is that he is not explaining what type of objectivity it has. Plus, he considers morality as mafhum mahovi, which is right. The second view, how many views are there? Five. We said there are five te major theories about moral goodness and badness. The second is to say that goodness and badness only express or are expressions of emotions and feelings of the moral observer or moral judge when you say something is good means you are expressing your happiness and approval when you say something is bad you are expressing your disapproval therefore according to them if someone says to it, someone else For example, I imagine someone has made a theft. He says, you stole this laptop. <laughs> I am thinking of my stolen laptop. Okay. So he says, you stole this laptop and it is bad. According to this theory, they say, when you say it is bad, you are not adding any new meaning to this. You are just saying you have stolen and I am unhappy. I don't approve this. That's it. You are not making any extra, you know, expression or you know giving any extra information or when you say you have helped this poor person and this is morally good again they say it just means you have helped this person and i am happy with this i approve this that's it there's nothing in the world more than this I am happy. Like, for example, I see my friend has uh, 
for example, a dress in, uh, with a certain color that I like. I say you have, for example, uh, put on this color and it is good. It means that I am happy. I'm enjoying looking at this. Nothing about the reality. This is the second opinion. So these are the people who reduce morality into emotions and feelings and attitudes. These are technical terms. Some people have tried to distinguish between attitude and emotions. We will talk about it, inshallah. The third opinion is the opinion of the people who say morality is just based on agreement or contract. Either we make agreement among ourselves. For example, we come together to form a society, a community, a group, a party, or little by little a culture, a country, and we can agree on something as moral and something as immoral. It's through our agreement or it can be through a kind of legislation or decision, a kind of contract, but nothing necessarily real. For example, to drive on the right side of the road or left side of the road. It's based on contract or agreement. Can anyone argue that objectively we have to drive on the right side or we have to drive on the left side? Perhaps no one can Argue. What is important is we should agree on something, I should, we should be consistent. Yeah? So, in the same way that in some societies people drive on the right side and in some societies people drive on the left side, in some societies people say a slavery is good, in some societies a slavery is bad. It's just, just based on, con on contract and agreement. There is no reality behind this. As you imagine, this can be very destructive. It makes morality just a practical decision. Of course, you can say, for our betterment, we agree on being honest. But this means that there is no basis, there is no big difference between honesty or dishonesty. Just practically we approve honesty. Maybe a situation comes that people say it's better to be not honest. Because others are not honest, so it's better that we are not also honest. This was the third view. Now we go on to the fourth view. And this is what is known in the West as divine command theory. Divine command theory. This is the theory which says good and bad are not objective, are not real. They are based on command of a legislator, a lawmaker, someone who has authority and power. For example, divine command theory says it's God who makes good and bad. God says, "Adelu, be just." This makes justice good. This opinion has long history in all different parts of the world. In the West, it goes back to the time of Socrates and before Socrates. Socrates has, in his discussions and dialogue, this as a topic. Is it something good because it is commanded by God 
or because it is good, it is commanded by God. I repeat, is something good because it is commanded by God or 